Hi, everyone. It's uh, great to be here, and it's great to see so many people in 3D. Um, so I'm not used to it anymore. Uh, so I'm honored to be introducing our next panel titled Democratic Rights and Privacy in the Pandemic Years. In the last two years, the pandemic has had a drastic effect on the fundamental rights of Indian citizens. From protests to enforcement of draconian lockdown measures, democratic ideals have taken a hit. In this chat with Abhinav Sekri, Akar Patel, and Dr. Usha Ramanathan, uh, we will discuss the trajectory of democratic rights in India over the pandemic years. Dr. Usha Ramanathan is an internationally recognized expert on law and poverty. She is a research fellow at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, teaches environmental law, labor law, and consumer law at the Indian Law Institute, and is a regular guest lecturer at many universities around the world. She is a frequent advisor to nonprofits and international organizations. Dr. Ramanathan is also the South Asia editor of the Law, Environment, and Development Journal. Her research interests include human rights, displacement, thoughts, and environment. To our second panelist, Akar Patel is a journalist, a rights activist, and an author. He served as the head of Amnesty International India and currently serves on their chair of the board. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, the conversation will be moderated by Abhinav Sikri, a lawyer practicing in Delhi who focuses on criminal law and procedure. He edits the Proof of Guilt blog and is an off counsel with the IFF litigation team. Over to you, Abhinav. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, the, I think this is working. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just so for everyone's benefit, the plan will be to have the conversation with the panel for around 45 to 50 minutes, and then we can open the floor for questions. Uh, so, what we had in the previous session was a, a focused sort of discussion with respect to technology and privacy. And at the start, I just wanted to bring all of us back to five years ago, where it's just on the 24th of this month that we celebrated the anniversary of the judgment in Puttaswami. And Puttaswami was not just about privacy in one aspect. And one of the most remarkable things about that judgment was the recognition that privacy inheres in every aspect of the individual. It, it linked privacy to the idea of living a life with dignity. And that promise is what was given by way of that judgment on the 24th of August 2017. What we have had is obviously a change in the way the courts wanted us to look at how we imagine the constitution. It's not that it wasn't being viewed that way, but nevertheless, what the strength of that judgment was that it forces everyone, it forces the conversation to shift. And the conversation has shifted. Tanmay at the start of our session today mentioned the judgment in Navtej Johar. That is a judgment that is from the Supreme Court. There are countless other smaller litigations that are there, that are pending, where that battle is being fought every day to recognize that vision of a life with individual dignity. That is actually at the heart of what it means to be living under a constitutional regime where you are no longer subject to the police power of the state arbitrarily. And where we are today is where we're sort of in limbo, right? And there was a, there was a wonderful article by Apar, who I can't see here, but well, over the past week itself, where he, he talked about the promise of Puttaswami and what can still happen. And, there were certain red flags that were raised there. I would urge everyone to consider it if they haven't. So what we'll talk about is obviously there'll be a focus on what has been over the past two years given, given COVID and the kind of data maximization that we saw because of COVID and its impact on civil liberties and democratic rights. But also uh, the conversation is bound to branch out into various other directions. So just a heads up for all that. So without further ado, I just wanted to pose a, a sort of startup question to the both of you. Which is, in starting uh, with Usha, when we, when we get a judgment like Putta Swami that really you know, puts a marker on changing the, it's like a kaleidoscope changing how we are required to view and how the state is required to view the individual. What did you think its impact could be when that happened? Like, I just want to you know, capture that element of promise which may have been lost over time. <laughs> I'm actually not as uh, despondent as you are. I think it takes people time to understand what a right is. You know, we battled for the right to privacy. 
Maybe we wouldn't have put up such a spirited battle if the state hadn't gone to the court and said people don't have that right. It's a very, very unusual thing for any state to do. And especially one which has a constitution, the job of the state is to protect, uh, protect and preserve our rights and to further our rights. What we had instead was a state, and it's very interesting, you know, we've had three uh, attorneys general, the last three attorneys general, including the one who's there now, each of them has taken this position, two of them in the courtroom, that we don't have a right to privacy. So it's, it's extraordinary. It, you know, it's not the kind of thing that happens. I mean, even when a state is violating people's rights, they will call it an exception. They'll call it a state of exception, and therefore they'll violate the right. But here you had the state going in and saying, what do you mean right to privacy to the people? They don't have a right, and we can do you know, what we will with it. So from there, it's one thing that we have to understand what we fought for and got. It's another thing, it's, it's, it's one more thing that the state is going to resist it. After all, it went there saying that there is no right to privacy. It's not like they're going to slip in and say, oh, the, you know, the court has told us that everybody has a right to privacy. Now let's work for it. It's not going to happen. So unlike some of the other rights, which are already in the Constitution, say the, even the right to you know, the freedom of uh, speech and expression, which is so much under threat today, even that the state knows what it is and people know what it is. So we kind of know... ID numbers, the Aadhaar card and the phone number. <laughs> and this is Bangalore. So uh, we, we are living um, with a government that, has, that uh, professes to have an ideology. Um, but it doesn't have any theory of state or a theory of constitution. So unlike other ideologies, let's say uh, Islamic fundamentalism, the Modudi idea, that you have unity of government uh, and then that which, which comes out of something called Tawheed and then the uh, relationship of the citizen with the state is determined by a set of laws. So there is a theory. Communism similarly has something like We have an extremist ideology with no theory of state with no idea of constitution. So they've just taken or they've sort of, it's appropriated, uh, uh, legitimately, we should say, through the democratic pro uh, process, but with no real underpinning of what the relationship of the individual is with the state. There is a, uh, the, the, uh, the, the BJP believes that the individual's relationship with the state is exactly the same as the individual's uh, relationship with the nation. And so for, for me, my duties are to stand up and to salute and to wave the flag and so on. And those are important. The rest of it is not that important. And I think it shows not only in the courtroom, but also in the language. So if you look at constitutional rights, Article 19, Article 21, Article 25, these are not things that the party sets great store by. These are not things that we enjoy uh, I'll just uh, amend with, what does the uh, Panna Pramukh do? What is the role of the Panna Pramukh? The Panna Pramukh is given a list of people who are beneficiaries. Who's got Ujwala? Who's got that subsidy? Go to the neighborhood, knock on that door, make sure they come out and vote. That is the role of the state appropriated by the party, the lack of privacy being the fact that the person who has, because of their economic status, um, been subjected to bullying, I would say, a pressure most certainly to be able to act uh, politically in a particular way. This is where it goes. And this is where it goes without any resistance from the rest of the state. The bureaucracy, the people who are part of the uh, EC, there is no pushback from, from that at all. To come back to the question, very positive on the way that the legal framework has moved. But we should assume that the pushback from the state and this party will actually continue. Uh, uh, okay, looking at that concept a little more in terms of the idea of the inert state or the benign state, I want to link it to also some conversations that we had in the previous panel. The idea that look, individuals are consenting to giving of certain data and therefore you know that can lead to you know, looking at data in a certain way when it gets aggregated. I actually wanted to flip that to say that look, even if I wasn't consenting, my normal activity allows for that massive amounts of data to just exist and the state today like the example that you just took has the ability to you know segregate to act on it to make it may not intrude into my privacy 
but the possibility of surveillance, especially after COVID, and we'll come to that more specifically, but especially after COVID, the possibilities of surveillance are like abounding so much that for me at least, I, I wanted to ask both of you, how do you think we can start pushing back on that or is it even, you know, is that a point of no return where how do we deal with that level of surveillance that has just now become possible? Where even on the minutest of things or even at the, at the bigger things such as for instance, replacing your uh, toll booths with RFID tags, things like that, smaller things such as, okay, who all have subsidy, who don't have subsidy, you are able to classify a neighborhood in a certain way. So, do you think post-COVID, how do we start clawing back in terms of the surveillance that became possible because of the large amounts of data that you know all of us were frankly very willing to give also in the idea of, okay, there's going to be public threat, there's going to be health threat, etc., etc. So, a lot of people became willing where they might not have otherwise been willing. So, just wanted to have your thoughts for the both of you on that. Okay, I just have to respond to Akar first on yeah. the <laughs> on the expectation of the inert state that we that you think we have. Actually, we wouldn't be having this conversation if we thought the state was inert and is not going to act on what it has. The reason for the conversation and the reason for the concerns that we have here is because we know that when there is data, when there is information about every individual, it will be used and Controlling the state after it has all the power over us is not going to be the, you know, it's not going to be an answer to anything. So I, actually, I'm not sure I'm with you on that. But, uh, you know, this, uh, is, there a, is there a point of no return? I think we are nowhere near it. In the sense that what, when I look around me, I see a lot of confusion. I see a, uh, I see a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, relationships that are attempting to be developed between the state and companies, state and you know, various data businesses that want to come up. Uh, we have Srinivas here, he'll tell us about how this uh, AP, I've actually been wanting to just go and see a building which, can, which has been created only to house you know, extraordinary scrutiny on every person wherever they are at whatever point in time. And that's what, AP, uh, that's what uh, Telangana has uh, produced. So just looking at the building would be, you know, like looking at something that's historic, which we'll hope will become a dinosaur and die off after some time. I actually see a lot of confusion, and I think there has been a lot of data grabbing that has been going on without knowing what, what people are going to do with it. And in that process of data grab, I mean, we talk about the digital divide, and I think one of the very significant things of the digital divide is that people who are unable to control the way in which data about them is getting uh, uploaded, uh, have no clue what's being said about them. And if we think that, you know, it was classic because when the UID first began, they said we're going to have this incredibly impeccable database that will be created. You know, the voter ID list is all full of errors. Everything else is full of errors. And we've got this grand technology that's going to change the idea of error. And it will be perfectly recording all of us. And I think by now we know what that database is like. So now they don't know how many of those uh, names on the, and how many of the people, the numbers on that database of the UID have uh, numbers attached to it, telephone numbers. How many of those actually belong to them? And how many of those will work? And how many of those can actually get replaced in the sense if you have to change your number, you need your old number so that you can put in your new. It's an extraordinary system that they've created. Nobody knows how many people's biometrics work. We know that it doesn't work in a number of cases. We know that people are falling off the PDS map. We know they are having trouble with uh, NREGA. We also know that, for instance, in NREGA, they are saying that only people who have uh, a smartphone will be able to be supervisors, which means that a large number of people who would be doing the work well won't be able to, to do it now. So what you're going to get is all manner of garbled databases. And if this garbled database is going to be used to produce artificial intelligence, I am really interested to see what emerges. I think imagination is a good thing. So in my head, at least, it's not artificial intelligence. It's artificial imagination of some kind, because this is not about us. The problem, however, is that this greed for data and this, you know, picking up everything that you want 
is basically making all of them look for ways by which they can use it. I don't think they found it yet. Other than uh, UPI, I don't think, you know, the NPCI, I don't think anything else has really even taken off. You know, all the rest are sitting on the sidelines. They have, they've had 12 years, 13 years, and really nothing has come up. So I'm, the, the, uh, I don't have hope in this that we have garbled data. I think we are in deep trouble because government cannot function if it's going to depend on this kind of database. I also think that the question of national security that they keep talking about is going to become a very big thing if we're going to keep creating more and more and more databases where people are going to be reflected in various kinds of ways. A government may need accurate data if they have to know each person, but others who steal that data don't need accuracy. They just need it for various kinds of purposes to profile communities, to profile hunger, to profile malnutrition and stunting. They're going to use it in various kinds of ways, which we don't even know. And the idea that data collection is a separate issue from data breach, which is, which is a separate issue from harm because of breach of data, these have to be deeply interrogated. Mm -hmm. I really, really don't think the government understands technology. They just have hope that they can keep, the, can keep themselves where they are by picking up on the data that they think is getting generated. And it's, an, you know, it's, it's like, we need to get educated on this, but I think the government needs to get educated to know it doesn't know. I mean, if you don't know, you're ignorant. It's far worse than not knowing, and that's it, no? If you don't know that you don't know, it's terrible. And that's what I think our government is. They see the power, the possibility that it provides of power, but they don't really know, they don't know. They are being led by the nose by people who have business interests. And that's not going to take them very far. It will take us, it won't take us very far either. It's a dangerous place for all of us. But yeah, it's, a, it's an ignorant government and we need to do a lot of work educating it. If it is willing to get educated, it's like. Sure. Yeah. So I think the pushback will come essentially from uh, the lawyers. Because I don't think that things like privacy are in the domain of electoral politics in India. Fortunately, unfortunately, we are, these are not things, including freedom of religion, the right to freely convert if you want to, which are constitutional rights, but are not, if taken away by a state or a party or the union, are pushed back in the form of, uh, by, by uh, voters. And there is very little interest in the political parties to be able to pick these up. So, but fortunately, I should say, we have a very fine set of legal minds who have been interested and have uh, been engaged with issues like this, and we, which is why I think we've won a lot of civil rights victories in the last few years, that we've had people without necessarily large, um, without necessarily mass support, uh, having m moved court and been able to uh, push back against the state. I think in this uh, case also, much of the burden will be on the, the the, the lawyers and the civil rights activists, mostly the former. Um, I would agree with uh, Usha entirely that the Indian state's uh, intent and its capacity are mismatched. That they want they want everything to be uh, within control. Uh, last week we heard of news that it wanted the data of people who were flying in. And then I don't know what they do with that, but this will just add to a bunch of lists that they have. Um, having engaged with the elite agencies of this country, CBI, ED, I can tell you that the levels of competence are very low. That the ability to understand material and yeah, Beethoven ki over tomorrow server par sort of thing. It's like it, it's the the and it's not their fault. I think that the government's appetite to do stuff is is uh, enormous. Its capacity to be able to actually filter the material and make sense of it is quite is quite limited, um, and and it is malign. So I'm saying that these three things uh, in turn. So on that, one thing that you know, if if you were to turn back to Puttaswamy today, you would find that across that really lengthy opinion. By the way, it like it will take you a lot of time to get through Puttaswamy today, but. Again and again, the common refrain is that, look, yes, we are recognizing the value of that judgment at some level is that there is a recognition of the right to privacy. But there are two things that are there along with it. One, we are not defining its contours. That will happen as we go along. 
the battles are yet to come. The second, one key thing that will be required in those battles is the idea of a data protection law, which does not exist. So what I want to then like sort of move our conversation towards is these battles. And where I want to start with is actually these elite agencies that Akar, you mentioned, in terms of, you know, I mean, the police is and was, will continue to be the most visible form of the state for a common person. And I think in terms of the state's idea of privacy, I think what we see in terms of how the police responds to us, that, that for me at least sums up what it thinks of privacy. So just your thoughts in terms of what has been in terms of you know, state action, state interaction with private actors, and any other thoughts at least on that issue. And then, uh, Usha could sort of take that forward as well. So we were speaking of Hyderabad, where which is the uh, surveillance thing that they spoke of, that uh, Usha spoke of, that uh, Srinivas has uh, worked on. There also, again, in that city, which is not run by the BJP, um, I should add, the people were asked to um, hand over their cell phones, and the police were going through them to see what they were up to, and you know what uh, what the cell phone would uh, reveal randomly. This is also exactly how the uh, elite agencies um, so-called act. So when we were raided at uh, Amnesty, the uh, enforcement directorate brought along a set of private uh, operators because they didn't have the capacity to be able to clone our server. Uh, I don't know under what law they chose to do so, but they brought in people who refused to sign in. So while the other officers in the ED gave us their names and showed us their IDs. These people refused to give their names. They stayed in the office the entire night while the rest of us were asked to leave. And they sealed the room in which the server was while they uh, cloned it. Um, this, this is also the same experience that uh, Raghav Bell had at uh, Network 18 when he was still running it and not forced to give it up to Mukesh Bhai. Uh, it, the, was, was they came in with uh, private operators took the servers over, cloned them. Uh, what they did with that data, we don't know because we don't know what the relationship of the private operator is with the ED. Uh, my phone was taken from me and I asked on what basis it was and there was no uh, response from the ED. All of them in turn just flipped through it and took uh, um, what it is that they wanted. I was, uh, it was a much less secured um, period in terms of how I treated my uh, devices. So I guess they got whatever it is that they wanted. When you go to an uh, ED office, they ask you whether your phone is with you. And when you go to most of these agencies, including the CBI, you have to leave your phone at the desk at the, uh, uh, or the entrance. One of my colleagues with whom I was sitting was asked if that phone had been brought, and he said yes. They asked him to get the phone asked him to call somebody, and then they uh, pretended to be him on the phone. Now, now again, I don't know under what law this is done. They're trying to get evidence by pretending to be somebody else. And this is normal. The Indian state has no regard, no respect for the privacy of those people that it accuses. And the idea that most of us who don't have physical engagement with the state, um, the belief that it is either benign or that it is, it is uh, inert is absolutely wrong. There is some, there is stuff going on. They might not be competent at it, but they, they, but they want to do it. And they don't care what the law says. Even if we have, I think our lawyers have brought us great judgments uh, in recent times, but it's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessary for the state to follow the law. And um, this, this came as a, a surprise to me as well, but, but, this, but the, the enforcement agencies don't care about the law. They'll do what they want. And if and when it is that you get, the ED has a conviction rate of 0.5%, I'm told. And I'm not really surprised, because the, the point is not really to make sure that the rule of law prevails and you get convicted. The point is to actually harass you at the beginning so that you stop doing what it is that you're doing or you fall in line. Um, and one, and the best way of doing this is to make sure that they know as much about you that they can use um, nastily, um, and which is exactly what they do. I think that the, those people who have been in contact with the agencies would have a very different view um, of um, a privacy laws had they not been. I think that the danger that we are in uh, as uh, citizens um, in case the state shows us its uh, 
malign face is quite high. And I think that people should realize that, that the state in India, um, when it chooses to target somebody, um, uh, Umar Khalid is in jail because they went through WhatsApp messages, which he didn't participate in. He was just one of the people who was on the group. That's the basis for keeping him in jail. This is the third year. Um, the, it, it makes sure, the state makes sure that because of this loss of privacy that you have, the fact that you were on that group, you are under threat and they will use it uh, against you in the most vicious way possible. So since Akar said that it's the lawyer's job to deal with this, I'll just do a little bit on what the law would say about this and how we would read the law if we had to take this forward. And of course, you'll have to do it so you'll know the rest of the argument. Uh, he's the lawyer, that's why. So the, the first thing in the privacy judgment, which I think all of us need to know, it hasn't been foregrounded sufficiently, is that we have a principle in this country that nobody can waive their fundamental rights. So if you have a right and you don't want it, you don't have a choice. You have the right. You may not use it. You may say, I'm not going to speak at all. I don't want this right, you know, freedom of speech and expression. That's fine. You don't have to speak. But the right is still yours. So there is no question of waiver. And it's one of the very interesting things that nine judges, you know, when the nine judges decided, this was the principle. And very soon after, within a year after, or just a year, uh, uh, you know, after this judgment, you have the UID judgment, which is the Puttaswamy 2. And in that judgment, it would seem like, you know, sometimes judges don't know how to read the law. This is true. That's why you have precedents that are overruled. You have curative petitions which go back to court. You have reviews. So judges sometimes really don't understand the law when they apply it. So in the UID judgment, they decided to waive the right to privacy for people who require uh, food, you know, if they need socio-economic rights, then, you know, they don't need the right to privacy. It was not for the judges to decide that on behalf of a people. If you can't waive your own fundamental rights, where does the power come to waive somebody else's fundamental rights? Without even asking them. And even if you did, as a judge, you should know that you can't waive somebody else's fundamental rights. So I think the f basic idea of saying that rights cannot be waived is really saying that it is only the people who can hold the state in check. And if you start playing with the rights of people, you can't keep the state in check. And why do you need to keep the state in check? Because people have rights, but those rights have to be ascertained, I mean, they have to be protected by the state. So the state is not expected to function like it, it has limitless powers. All our rights are limitations. They are the limits to which the power of the state extends. And as a principle, I think in the last session too, we mentioned that it is important to establish principles. And it's from principles that we then move to action. And this is the fundamental principle. So there are two in that. One is that you cannot, nobody can waive uh, fundamental rights. And the constitution is about the limits of power of the, of the state. It is not about the limits of fundamental rights. People have rights. The state has power in a manner, in, you know, to the extent that it does not violate the rights of the people. So that's a, it's a very basic uh, kind of thing. There's the other part of it is uh, what you were talking about, the mobile phones and things. Uh, and uh, Abhinav has actually written a very interesting article on what all of this means in relation to an earlier case. What's happened is that See, in Article 21, we have, it's one of the most strangest articles. And it says, no person shall be deprived of his life or personal uh, liberty, except according to procedure established by law. And like they pointed out when this discussion was happening in the Constituent Assembly, for all our other fundamental freedoms, which is, you know, freedom of speech and expression and association and assembly and all the rest of it, they say that there can only be reasonable restrictions. So reasonable is an adjective. And therefore, that is subjected to interpretation, but reasonable limits the way in which the state can use this. In Article 21, there is no such thing. So they just say, except according to procedure established by law. And there is a whole history to this. We'll do that another time that we have three hours. But for now, I won't say any more. But the interesting thing in this is that 
this due pro this um, procedure established by law replaced something that was called due process of law and again it's a long story but we just shifted at some point during the constituent assembly debates we must remember that this was you know the constituent assembly was meeting during partition the constituent assembly was in was functioning when mahatma gandhi got shot and there is no way that people who were sitting in the constituent assembly were not impacted by these two so and they were going to be the executive you know the the people from within they were going to be the executive they trusted themselves and they felt the need for certain powers so there are you know there are ways in which some of this therefore got articulated about 20 years later to 25 almost 30 years later well actually 17 years later this started you know the court started talking about rights differently and in about 28 years they said it it does say procedure established by law but it is actually what we need to look at the substantive due process which means that any procedure that parliament will uh, will impose on a people through a law cannot be constitutional procedure so we have a criminal procedure code that criminal procedure code was first you know set in place in colonial times soon after we got independence and soon after the constitution came into being the first round of you know trying to weed out some of the problems in the criminal procedure code was done in 1973 we had a second round and now this see the criminal procedure code like i said about the power of the state this too is about limiting the powers of those who are entering your home who are taking you away who are arresting you you know the kind of uh, treatment that you can be subjected to it tells the criminal procedure code is about saying you have to operate within this limit it's not saying we give you a license to operate because we've allowed you to go search and seize you have to have so if you're searching you need to know what you're searching for you can't say you know i'm coming into your house i may find something i've got a warrant to enter because i have a case that's there now i'm going to search everything let me look at what you are ah, you have love letters from your it's not their business if it if that's not what they are investigating then they have no right to be looking at this now it's well recognized now and i mean personally before i launch on to anything else i'll say please all of you throw your mobile phones away mr nilakani advised me of that when he was talking about in an interview he said why are you complaining about aadhar the mobile phone is more pernicious than aadhar so these are the two things he was advising us we shouldn't have and so i don't see why we are you know why we are walking around with this and as you can see now the mobile phone is really pernicious and so you know a, but if you won't then it's also important to remember that the mobile phone has kept getting the technology has kept getting changed and now your whole life is on it you think a thought you quickly put it down there and then you forget you put it there so it's much more than what what used to, you know when they said an englishman's home is his castle and you can't just enter and do what you want the mobile phone is much more than that so if they want to look at something in the mobile phone they need to know what they are looking for and then they can ask for that to be uh, shown you can't say give me your mobile phone i want to know what you have in it that right actually does not exist but we have to train the police but before then we have to train the courts to understand that this right does not exist and why it does not exist laws are made by parliament we know now that it's not only now but for some why we've been battling to say that there must be pre legislative discussion because all of us want to participate in the making of laws you are making a law the state sees it as making a law for us meaning like it's to impose it on us we actually see law making as saying what are the limits of the state so we need to be able to say that we need to be able to look at the law and say you know like the criminal procedure identification act you know give me your saliva give me your sputum give me your whatever you have this is not a law at all so you know if you don't have a discussion and if people don't tell the state what is all right for it to take as its power that is not legitimate law at all So I'll just talk about that because I can tell more on the negative. An anecdote and and a and a comment on that. So a merger of these two, I found in a case some time ago, was where the earlier law was being used by the police to say that look, we have the power to take a thumbprint. 
it doesn't say where we need to take the thumbprint. We will take the thumbprint on the mobile phone. And that means that we will use that <laughs> to open the phone. So just on that. But uh, you know, where that comes into is the point that you were making was that battles that are being fought. And this is actually, you know, coming back to the point about battles that had to be fought that Puttaswami had identified. This is one amongst the many of them that are actually in court. Where, I mean, the unfortunate thing is that some courts have actually held not exactly in favour of this view, where they have not viewed the law from the lens that the idea of the criminal procedure code or the constitution is to limit the idea of the, the intrusion that the state has allowed within the realm of a person's zone, let's say, or dignity or autonomy, however which way you want to frame it. But the idea is that you have to maximise the state's interest as far as its pursuit of an investigation go. If there is a presumption of legitimacy there, which it's it's sort of surprising that you know it's it's something that courts just don't want to question as often as they ought to. It's that, that's just a comment that I wanted to make. Wanted to again shift the focus on a, a theme, and I think this will probably be the last theme that we get to touch on, given that we are running out of time. Of the idea that we need to hold the state accountable, and I think it's a theme that at least on the criminal side. Or actually any any sort of field, we've seen that our laws are actually still abound with, you know, provisions that are saying acts in good faith ought to be protected. So if you look at the Customs Act or any other legislation for that matter, even the Criminal Procedure Identification Act for that matter, you look at it, it will say that any acts made in good faith by the officer are not subject to any action. But who gets to decide that? And when you think about privacy, I'm just thinking about the example of that movie, The Lives of Others where that's the job of the police in East Germany. Like, you are, no matter where you, that house is going to be bugged throughout, they will listen to it no matter what hour of the day. And then ultimately, the, the police has to decide, okay, are they listening to pertinent or non-pertinent? Same in the US, the idea that, you know, it's pertinent, non-pertinent. If you are listening to non-pertinent, how do you hold them accountable? So bringing that to India, what do you, I think it's fair to say that all of us may not think that the existing regime is enough in terms of holding the state accountable. But just your thoughts on that and then, you know, which directions can can those uh, ideas be pushed? Because I, I think without that measure of accountability, especially for things like intrusion into mobile phones, it's, it's sort of illusory to have those rights. So just wanted to have both of your thoughts on that? Uh, so, some of it is happening. I think that because of good laws, uh, Arvesh Kumar, um, th this week I think it was, this is, a, this is uh, something new, um, uh, well, sort of relatively new, where if you are arrested uh, in a, a form which is not uh, laid out uh, as the rightful one, it's the uh, police that is held to account and there was an uh, inspector I think it was this week that was sent to jail uh, because he didn't follow the rules. So there is that. As individuals we can actually push back. I, I tried to uh, get the court to find the CBI uh, officer who signed off on the document on the LOC that I was put on. Uh, without my being informed I was told uh, I was uh, stopped from leaving the country and um, had I been told that I was on that list, I might have moved court and been able to uh, get myself out of it. But not being told of it, I, I told the court that he should be made to pay for my ticket. Uh, the court said that the CBI should say sorry instead. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but, but, I, but, but my lawyer did say that he looked terrified that the man who was sitting there who had actually put me. And I think that we should push those of us who have the liberty to be able to take on the state and the freedom to be able to do so. Not not all of us have that liberty, and, and I sort of accept that. But I think that we should hold individual agents within the state uh, accountable for what it is that they do. And this can be at any level. It can be at the level of the person who brings that form to you, as the one did to our house uh, this week, saying that you, you need to put your Aadhaar card and link it to your a voter ID. On, on what basis are you saying that? And take it up higher, make sure that the, the people who sent him or that he at least or she at least feels that he ought not to say or she ought not to say this to the next person, which I didn't do actually and I should have done that. Make sure that they know that what they're doing is not lawful and that, that to try and pressure people into doing something that 
uh, they ought not to be doing is something that they might be uh, punished with. And I think that this is at the individual level. But I think that there is sufficient agency that we have to make sure that, this, that the state and the elements that uh, comprise the state are in some form uh, held to account. If I can just take it uh, slightly tangential, kind of, yeah. So I was thinking of uh, what happened with Snowden. So Snowden gets all these documents, he releases them, the state sees him as prisoners, uh, you know, it, he has to go away and not come back to this uh, country. And then, you know, the state says that you know, we are preventing terrorism through this. And we need this kind of power because it's a national security issue. And then months pass and then days pass and then there is nothing. So seven years later, Snowden is asking, he asked, I mean, it's since two more years after that. He says, so you said that this will help you stop terror activity. Can you give me one instance of where that has happened? I think any state that is going to be collecting this data saying that this is what we are going to use it for uh, should be asked this question about did it really work? The classic things that we are seeing in our setup, for instance, is that we have a labor code, you know, all these social security code. And all unorganized laborers are told, workers, they're told that you have to get onto this database, link your UID number with it, link your bank account number, link your mobile phone number, and keep reporting to us every time there is a change in your status. Because if you do that, and there is some crisis someday and we decide to put 500 rupees in your bank, we will put it only if you are on this database. Otherwise, we are going to leave you alone. So no state has a right to say we will abandon people in need. It just has no right to say it. So to say that I will only provide for you, if you are on a database, the way I ask you to be on that database, but I will take no obligation on myself. This, this is extraordinary. And you know, I find it kind of strange. This is the land of Mahatma Gandhi and non-cooperation. If you think something is wrong, you shouldn't be doing it, no? If we think that, you know, it's not all right to be giving all this data, why, why we just meekly say, oh, they asked, what do I do? So if we were giving this kind of mobile phone to shopkeepers, I'm not surprised that we give it to the state. But actually, it's okay to give it to the shopkeeper. It's not a great idea giving it to the state. So maybe we need to go back and read permanent record and find out, look again at why Snowden says he did what he did. It's an extraordinary tale, which is continuing. So that's what. The other, actually, I found it very strange when Akar was saying it's the lawyers who are going to do it. I think the lawyers have been the most vilified community in this country. And, you know, they've also earned a good bit of it. But, <laughs> but, but and I have to say this, that uh, some of us who are working on the UID litigation know that any lawyer who was interested in civil liberty, any lawyer who believed in the Constitution, asked to be given a case so that they could appear in court and argue this matter. They said, if we lose this case, there is nothing left of the Constitution. When the privacy matter was on, we actually got calls saying, do you have a brief that I can handle because I have things to say to the court. Lawyers who would normally be making tons of money by you know, going from court to court, sat in the, in the courtroom and you know, had listened to the other side speak, which normally they would have the juniors sitting there. And when we asked them, why are you here? You know, shouldn't you be, in, it's okay, we'll keep notes for you. They said, this is what they said. They said, there will be no constitution left if this case doesn't go through. So it was that significant. Puttaswami was not just another judgment. It was not just another judgment on privacy. It was really about securing the idea that people are free in this country. That freedom we have to fight for. That no right is ever given. Rights are fought for. And so this was one stage of that fight and we need to, you know, continue doing that. And uh, just the last thing on that good faith, it's a, that was a colonial invention, like law itself was a colonial invention. Actually, when we were studying, you know, when we were reading a book on Gandhi, you know, on Gandhi, it's a Charles de Salvo book on Gandhi, and how he used the law in South Africa. Uh, to, so he went to the court, he went to the government, he worked with the law, because he was, you know, he'd been trained in England, he came back believing in the law. And like one student pithily put it, he said, by the time Gandhi left South Africa, he left the law behind. And when you think about what he did when he came back, what was his engagement with the law? His engagement with the law was to say, 
you say it is sedition that I say this, and I am saying that the law is bad. If you believe in the law, you do what the law asks you to do, but I can't follow a law that I know is bad. He went on the Dandi march and said, you can't make a law saying that you're going to ta tax salt. That law is bad, so I'm, I have to break the law, because the law is bad. So I think that you know, learning that distinction is very important, and I think you know, in, for lawyers in this group, I think the Gandhi was perhaps the first serious critic of positive law. And positive law is something that the colonial people brought to us and they took it to every colony because that's one way when we say rule of law, they devised this idea of rule of law. But then they converted that into a rule which will be made by the law that they make. So I think this, uh, the good faith clause is part of that. So people, under this colonial uh, kind of idea, people don't act in good faith. The state acts in good faith. So it's like an inversion of everything that should be. So we actually need to junk the good faith clause from these laws and make people answerable. It's not just the good faith clause. Then there is a sanction power. So if you do find that someone has acted in bad faith, you have to get the sanction of the same state that was using them to do what was being done. So these are, you know, these are all uh, remnants of uh, colonial devices which all of us have to work to have thrown out. Both of these, by the way, were also there in the personal data protection bill. So, in terms of data breaches, then you have that same regime that there will be data breaches and good faith may still be protected. <laughs> yeah, please. You know, I think this idea of data protection, we should be really... We, sometimes people conflate data protection law with privacy law. And actually, when you look at what they're saying, they're saying, I will collect all your data and we'll keep it carefully. <laughs> it's not privacy. It is 7.40 and I think it's only fair that we open the floor to questions. Okay. Go back. Ah, yeah. I think the instructions that I have from the panel to start from the back. not that they are treating it as a state of exception. The, the problem is that they are routinizing something that shouldn't be there at all. So, uh, and the, you know, the, uh, the thing that I think some of us have been feeling for some time is that the delay in the system, it's something that has been said recently too, that you have all these major cases that are, you know, 370, electoral bonds, uh, and a range of cases, including money bill, all these cases are just pending and they keep getting delayed. We noticed this even during the UID case, where you go to the court and then they'll say, okay, let's figure out what we can do and they'll admonish the court saying, where the government saying, no, no, you can't make it mandatory, you can't refuse services, if you do next time, I'll wag my finger at you. It didn't work. <laughs> so they went on anyway and then they, you know, they kind of created the whole database. At one time, at one point, the court said, that this will not be treated as a fait accompli. If we find that this is not okay, we will have this whole thing destroyed. But then it did become a fait accompli. So I think the problem is that this kind of delay in the judicial system, and this kind of, you know, by the time we learn how to assert our rights, certain practices start emerging. For instance, take the 2000, uh, 2019 uh, amendment that they made to the Aadhaar Act. It's completely unconstitutional, it's totally against what the government, uh, what the court had said. It stays on the statute book and companies use it, you know, because it allows them to, uh, to use it and the state wants them to use it. I think today's paper has a thing on monetizing data. 
and of course it's coming to Karnataka for Karnataka is unfortunately the place which seems to generate all of this in the beginning and then they come back to you for the <laughs> So your job is going to be to tell them, I'm sorry monetizing data is not okay, never mind what you do with it. And there is a difference between anonymity and anonymization and anonymization doesn't even happen, it can't happen, especially with all the linkings that you've done. So you can't have this, right? So, I'm sorry, when you ask a question, I tend to wander. You have to forgive me for that. Let me just add very briefly that this is exactly the way that the state handles all restrictions on itself. That Article 19, the right to a peaceful assembly uh, is basically, it exists only on paper. To have a, to what, what you and I would see on television, uh, on news television abroad, small groups of people holding up play cards and banners, you know, four people, five people, ten people outside a government office or a, or a, a corporate office, you can't do that in India. So the, the right is with the police. So they, you, you have to fill out a form to say, we'll be there at this time, so many of us, this is the car number, this is the phone number, I don't know if they ask for the other card yet, I'm sure they do. And then it's the police's right to tell you whether you can actually go on to protest. We had this thing in the morning today for Bilkis Bano, we had to take permission from the state to be able to legitimately exercise a fundamental right, a right which enjoys a high degree of a protection from of encroachment by the state doesn't really, really exist. And I think that what, what you just spoke of is just an extension uh, by the state into all of these other freedoms that we have. Where that doesn't mean that you don't go to court. 
you have to go to court because you know also that it will be a repeat play game. You have to hope that that order will carry value, and it does carry value. Like I have to say, there are instances enough of them where you know the next time when you go there, it will matter, and it does matter. So which is why it does still have value to keep combating it. And I would say people do do it. Obviously, again, it would be naive to assume that everyone has the liberty to do it. Those who do, I think, often enough end up doing it. Okay, I have a slightly different perspective, maybe because of having lived many years longer. <laughs> Which also means that, you know, you see that these things happen in cycles. So in the beginning, and I'm not going back to Genesis, but the constitution, <laughs> we had A.K. Gopalan being put away because he was a communist, and they were terrified of communists at that time. And then you slowly find that, you know, it took about almost 20 years, 17 years, to turn that around and say that, Okay, that was a mistake. We need to recognize that people have rights. And then we have a you know burgeoning of rights jurisprudence. And then for see, institutions are by nature conservative. So if you if you, when we want them to do something that is not within the within the status quo, it requires a lot of explaining and a lot of work. So once that shift happened in the late 70s for about 10, 15 years we had a good run, when rights were recognized, where uh, many divides were being looked at differently, public interest litigation brought many things to notice of people and to the courts. And then we start, you know, the, with the liberalization, with opening up the economy, many rights then started, you know, constitution started getting, uh, being made more pragmatic rather than principled. And then you come, you know, you come into a phase now where it's true, I mean, this government does seem to love very much to keep people in control. But I think it is important in this forum to recognize that technology is becoming a collaborator in this. And technology, come, you know, we often have discussions to say, how is it that something that was so exciting in the beginning of this century has become a cause of so much anxiety now? Everybody loved walking around. I remember so many days people... They wouldn't have got a call, but they'd have the phone up to their ear because it was exciting. You know, it was like nice to have that kind of stuff. Now it's a cause of anxiety. So I would really also shift the focus a little bit from the state because if if uh, the tech world doesn't collaborate with the state, the state can't do this. So uh, and we must remember that conservative institutions take a long time to understand changes that are coming. See, people who are in the high courts and supreme courts are all above 45, 50. So they, you know, while you guys just get it like this, oldies like me take a long time to understand what you are doing. And we understand a part of it. So the kind of educating that is needed to be done is not just about the technology, but what about the technology means. And why we need to constitutionalize this. So in that context, should I just, uh, before you, you were asking questions, but you know the last session you had, so there were set suggestions being asked for what needs to be done. I'm going to take the liberty of mentioning a few. Is that okay? Yeah. So one uh, one definite suggestion that I have is that you know now we are being told that innovation will be stifled by rules, and therefore don't have rules. Let's have the innovation, and then we'll build the rules around the innovation. I think that's hugely problematic. On the contrary, I would say when any new technology that is likely to violate people's rights or which is likely to do things like surveillance, which are constitutionally problematic, there should be a moratorium. You can't have facial recognition technology, for instance, just being rolled out. It is not the right of anybody to be able to do this kind of thing. A moratorium doesn't mean that you do it for 10 years or 15 years, but there has to be enough time for people to know what it is. You know, in the first session we heard that uh, you learn on the job. So you, you, know, you start a technology and then you realize that some things are not okay and then you, know, you improve on it. So privacy by design, you might make a mistake in the beginning and then you come back to it. All this is being done at the price of people's liberty and that's really not okay. So long as technology was benign, it was a different story. It is no longer benign. And the ambitions on data and the ambitions of collaboration with the state, which is what we're seeing happening now, is not acceptable. So I would say one of the first things that we need is that we have a moratorium, we have a public debate about the use of any of these kind of systems, and then we can talk about whether we allow it to roll out or not. I know that it's a 
it will seem like a tall order, but we also know that, say, the state of you know California said no to facial recognition technology. They didn't say, oh, the rest of the world has it. It will come crawling in and creeping in. We know, for instance, you were referring to the toll, uh, you know, to the toll system. It's a complete surveillance system, and we are all just neatly going into it. So when we say that uh, you have a choice, you don't really have a choice. You're penalized if you don't do it. They are cutting down on all those, uh, you know, that one. Uh, you know, one exit that you have, one uh, one route that you have, where you pay double, and so they make they make you to, as you know they make you look like a criminal because you're not willing to conform. And conformity is to what a tech you know, a te you know this the first e toll uh, committee report. If you go back and look, since then you can see that this is the direction in which it's gone. The uh, just quickly one or two more, and then I'm done. So we also need to look at reports that are coming out from different parts of the world. The rest I'll keep for another time, but this I really feel we need to look at because there is a report, for instance, called which is on human augmentation. And yesterday we were having a discussion about this, and you know, some young people were saying that this is already being used, for instance, in sports. That you find ways of augmenting, you know, so they monitor your sleep, your hydration, you know, how many breaths do you take, all of it. And then they improve your performance in sports. But now it's being talked about, this human augmentation report is about the soldier. They're saying, and what is it that they're saying? They're saying that the human being is inadequate and has to be improved by an interface with the machine. I just think everyone should go back home and spend a little time figuring out whether that's how we want to live. I mean, I can answer for myself. <coughs> One last question, and I think you sort of overshot time. I had asked Gyan to sort of facilitate again. Slightly from the back, please, sorry. Uh, my name is Gurdi, and uh, I'm just a uh, common citizen here. Uh, one of my questions is how does the state determine somebody's religion? Like, unlike age or address, which is physically verifiable, religion is something which exists in somebody's mind and they may decide to proclaim it to something else every day. How does it decide it and how does, it, how does the state enforce this? Uh, see, the religion is about, in our constitution, religion is about, a, it's a collective, it's a community. Right? It's not an individual right. So you are recognized as something. And you are recognized by, a, you know, so if you're born into a certain family, unless you're able to show that you move to some other religion, that's how the state will treat you. You may treat yourself any way you want. So the, uh, it is in a sense important because collective rights are also important in the constitution. So we don't want that right to go away for people who are, uh, you know, who belong to that collective. But for those who keep changing, so for instance, when the census comes and they say, or the NPR, they come and they ask you, what is your religion? And I say, I have no religion. They look at you and then they say, Acha, this one is Hindu, this one is Muslim. <laughs> and then once I put in the thing, I said agnostic. Just to see what happens, whether I am or not, it's my business. But I said, and they had no clue what that was. So I said, Acha, madam, and they went away without writing and I know that something would have got written after they left. See, we are also presuming, it's, uh, this is only about, uh, this, at this point I'm only on what they do in databases. Databases are the creation of those who enter data. So if they think you are something, they will enter it like that. You know, so if I call myself Usha Ramnathan and I say I am a Muslim, they will not record me as a Muslim. <laughs> Never mind what I do. Yeah, so it's a, at one level yours is a metaphysical question. At the practical <laughs> level, it's, that's all it is. There's no metaphysics. This, the Catholic Church in Gujarat has stopped baptizing people because the, state, the, the police comes in and wants a list of people who've come on Sunday. <laughs> this is a fact. So they, they've stopped all baptisms. If I should choose to, to convert out of my faith into Catholicism, I don't have that right. In seven states in India, and this is, these are post-2018 laws, if you want to, we are a culturally a conservative nation where, it, where if you marry into a family, you're most likely to be able to take on the faith of that family. You can't do that in India anymore. You have to fill out a form before you get married. The state will send a district magistrate or a, 
uh, a collector, depending on where you leave, that person will determine whether or not you can actually change your faith. So you have the right to say no. It's not just you and this, I, sorry, there's a person called the religious converter who also must fill out the form. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, but that's actually there in the English versions of all these laws. And the, the, and the religious converter. Indeed, and the burden of proof is reversed. It's not an adult woman's testimony that she converted of free volition is insufficient evidence for the state. The district magistrate will uh, will ask the family she's marrying into and the man she's marrying whether the, uh, the you know the word is a coercion whether that was used. She has no agency over her own change of faith. This this is where we are. I think with that, we have to bring this session to a close because we have overshot our time. I'd like to call Abhar to the podium. Abhar, we have to call Abhar. Thank you all for coming out today. This will only take uh, about two or three minutes. Um, Usha, as you were mentioning permanent record by Snowden, uh, as an uh, upper caste straight man, uh, when you read it, permanent record, you all I identified with permanent record. Because 1984 is the same year I was born. So I could see the waves of technology as Snowden explained them. So when you get early access to the internet at that age, at that time, it fills you with a sense of optimism, especially if you're introvert. So I re remember reading Arthur Cannon Doyle on like uh, entire CD, ripping my first song, uh, Rhinestone Cowboy. Yeah, like whatever you could get at that point in time, right? And what was my relationship with technology when it first started? It was about joy, wonder, exploration. And that kind of makes me feel conflicted when I look at technology today. I have optimism in technology because it's helped me become the person I am. But I do realize that today's visions are more dystopic. They are that fight by Netflix's series Black Mirror. And that's what you see here. That's what we've been discussing. So the potential for good is there because I've seen it. Now, today, why we have kept it, this entire event is bad law is of course because a lot of pe people on our Twitter always say, um, why you only in Delhi do you have a bad law office, etc. We hope to engage more with you. And I'd like to thank the panelists also. Some have actually traveled from Delhi. Uh, so we hope to continue engaging not only in Bangalore but in most cities because we do understand that the conversation around privacy, especially tech policy, is very, it's, it's, it's somewhat like a cabal of lawyers, technologists, and bureaucrats. And that needs to be much more open. It needs to have people who feel the comfort to walk in, the ordinary citizen who asks the question. And today it would not be possible without uh, IFF staff. Uh, all of them are here. They've flown in and there's a social component. So I encourage all of you, all of you in the, uh, there's some limited drinks. They run out quite soon. They didn't have the money. There'll be some food, but talk to them and chew a little more. Okay. And uh, in terms of my role and what do I see it at IFF, especially for the staff, is that of a coach. Seriously, I didn't undergo any management th uh, training. I stepped from a lawyer to being a manager of our organization and discovering what it means. So most of the, our victories, our work, is actually done by the staff. They're the players on the field and only the coach. But who's the real owner of this team? That's every citizen of India, especially the ones who purchase the tickets for the shows, <laughs> right? That's you, the donors. So please help us, please do contribute because our model is different. We are able to do this. We are able to do 10 different things. We are able to call out IRCTC and get the tender recalled. Why? <laughs> and unfortunately, that does have a financial component. <laughs> okay. So, as I, as I end today, uh, there's one book which has helped me actually assess my relationship with technology. It's completely not about technology. And it goes back to this theme about dystopian utopia. If you look at the dictionary definition of utopia, it means the place which is not here. It's a fantasy. And the dystopia is the inverse of that. Right? These are all visions. And there's a great book by Gail Omvet, which is called Seeking Begumpura, the social vision of anti-caste intellectuals, which says that Kabi dreamt of his utopia, calling it Amarpur, city of immortality. 
and sang of Premnagar, the city of love. Rai Das imagined his own version of it and named it Begampura, city without sorrow. It would be a city where there would be no taxes or toil. In quotes, where he could wander freely with his friends, something a Dalit could never do in actual Banaras. So, today, even if it doesn't serve towards a utopic vision by itself, the imagination does help in manifesting our reality tomorrow. So it is important not to feel despondent, not to give up, to keep pushing on. Join us for these conversations upstairs. Thank you all for coming today. Big round of applause for all of us. Thank you.